Before we go to prayer, we are in a, we're always in that way at, at Groveland Evangelical Free or soon to be Gateway Community Church, but we're in a ministry time. I just want to lift up some things that are going on. And this is a little different stage today because the Pinecone Singers are part of our community. They had a concert on Friday night and they had a concert Saturday afternoon. And they have one more today, if you haven't been yet, or you want to go again, at 2 p.m. You want to go again, Bonnie? All right, all right. That's amazing. 2 p.m. today, so know that that's going on in our community right here. On the 20th is Out There A Ways. It's the 20th of December. It's a Wednesday night. We have a gathering every Wednesday night. We're going to have it this Wednesday, and you can come. I understand we're having lasagna. But anyway, we have a gathering every Wednesday night. But the 20th, we are going caroling. So if you would like to be a part of that caroling, just note that that's coming the 20th of December, and that's there for everybody. Two weeks from today, I looked at my calendar, and God said it's not changing. It's going to happen, whether I want it to wait a little bit or not. Two weeks from today will be Christmas Eve. We have two worship services on Christmas Eve, one at 10 a.m., like we would do right now, uh, and another one at 4 p.m. So there are going to be different services, different sermons, so I invite you to come. It is a wonderful time, a wonderful time to say, why don't you come to worship with me? It's a great time to invite a neighbor, a friend, an enemy. It's a great time to invite them. The whole world stops to recognize the birth of Christ that day. So prayerfully be thinking about that. 35 different plates of cookies went out yesterday to different people in our community. There's one at my table that's going to go out on Monday to a working place if I don't eat it before. I'm kidding. Anyway, but at least 35 went out with an invite to our Christmas Eve services. So just know that's coming up, and we are about inviting. So that's there, too. And, of course, I love volleyball. If you want to be a part of that, that started at Tioga High School from roughly 7 to 8.30 p.m., and it's for the community. Those are just a small amount of things that are going on, small group ministry, all kinds of stuff going on. But know that our, our, our ministry is active. We are outwardly focused. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, what more can we say other than the way Paul said it? Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We're here today to recognize that, to absorb it, to understand it more than when we came in. And so we lift up this powerful hymn that Paul broke into praise. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, make no mistake about it. And we ask for a greater understanding, Holy Spirit, than when we first came in. So, Lord, I humbly ask that we exalt thee. May the words of my mouth not be my words, Lord, but with the gift and the attitude and the expectation of the Holy Spirit, we know you're here. Help us listen to you. Help me hear you. We ask this humbly but with expectation and gratitude, always. In Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. So I'm kind of like Bob Barker here on The Price is Right. i got to watch myself. I've been known to move around a little bit. And so now I really have to watch myself or it could be a great YouTube video for those of us <laughs> online. <laughs> I just want to do a little bit as we start this and dive into this really, really sincere and, and just full of Holy Spirit wisdom that Paul broke into as I begin to look at Advent and Christmas themes now into January. Okay, and I said we were done with Philippians last week because we did a whole series on it, and look where we landed on the first Advent theme, back in Philippians. But what a better place to land than where Paul writes into this hymn, and he starts with attitude. He starts in verse 5 with attitude. 
It's two weeks until Christmas. I got up yesterday and I realized I can't change that. <laughs> okay? And yes, I'm going to go Christmas shopping right around um, the day before Christmas. I love it. You get the best deals and the most entertainment. But <laughs> I still have to be prepared. We have people coming from other places in and, and the country, and they're coming here, and we have to get ready and prepared. And you all do too. You have to get my gift yet. Okay? <laughs> Nobody said amen. Anyway, <laughs> I just check on what is our attitude. Um, when I was in college, two weeks before Christmas or three weeks before Christmas, my attitude was, Lord, I got exams, and I need to do better than just pass them. I have to answer to my parents, <laughs> and I have to answer to myself and to God, and, and was preparing for that. Uh, parents, when my son was younger, were like, okay, we got to get this all done. We got to get the house right. We got to get ready. We got to get the gifts bought. We got to get certain things. What about Santa? All of this is part of the attitude. Some of us are we got family and friend coming. We got to get this ready. We got to get that ready. Some of us are going to be traveling. We got to get this ready before we leave. We got to do that. All of this is part of the attitude. I talked to a very close friend. It, it, it's his first. Christmas with him and his children without a loved one, his wife, a mother. And it's that first Christmas for them. And that's part of the attitude. For some of you, it's our first Christmas without this loved one who went to heaven. There's a song by Stephen Curtis Chapman around the Christmas time that, about his grandma who died in the month of December, and he says she's going home for Christmas. And that's part of our attitude. We all bring these different attitudes into the season. There's times where I'm thinking, I got to get this gift, and I don't have time to do it. I've got to make time. All two in the morning will work. Oh, the store's not open. Okay. We all bring these attitudes into the next two weeks. And Paul writes from a Roman prison, and he tells us something very clearly that is part of not just our culture, but the Roman culture, the whole world's culture. And he tells us before he breaks into this incredible hymn, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset, man, mindset as Christ Jesus. He doesn't say in your relationship with those you get along with. He doesn't say in the relationship with just a few people that is really easy to get along with. He says, in your relationship with one another. I'm like, well, that's great, but i got to get to everyone? Yes. Well, how am I going to do that? It's very simple, Paul says. Have the same mindset of Christ Jesus. Even when I'm trying to get a parking space and I'm almost ready to get it and someone pulls into it. And Paul says, well, you smile and you just pray, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be able to smile with them. What about the one that's coming for Christmas and I really don't agree with their politics, much less their whole human value system? <laughs> you love them. And you praise God they're coming to your house for Christmas. Really? Yes. That's the mindset. What about the fact that I don't know if I've got enough money to make Christmas work? How am I going to pay the bills? Use your head, get what you can, and have faith that God's going to provide in ways you haven't even seen yet. This is the mindset that Paul is asking for as we approach Christmas. What about the fact that um, I get called to play, as I look at Al here, a couple days before because other people are getting sick? You make it work, and you, you did and you're going to continue to make it work. What about this? What about that? My Lord was willing to give up his Godhead. I wrote the word deity because we have a hard time wrapping ourselves around. I'm still trying to work out what God gave up, and Paul writes in this passage. He had everything. He's the son of the living God. He had every ability to say, I'll go down there, but I'm going with my powers. Well, power is a pretty strong word, isn't it? And we live in a world that is ruled by power. 
from time to time, if not a lot. We live in a world where things are governed by how much power a person has. We're going to lay off this group of people because I need this part of the company to shine and let that company go. We live in a world where power demonstrates a lot. And what did Jesus do? He said, I'm willing to give it all up. Except for one thing, love. We'll get into that. There is a well-known preacher, author, Christian believer, seminary president at Dallas Theological, pastored Fullerton Evangelical Free Church for many, many years. I love him to death. I've read his books many times. I used to, I listened to him a lot as I was getting into ministry and growing in ministry, Dr. Charles Swindoll. He wrote a book on attitude. Now, I know that's really hard to read, and I should have done a better job, but your attitude is of grace right now. (laughs) <laughs> but I have put this on a, we used to read this every day when I helped Dean at camp. This was our morning prayer right here at the breakfast table for all the campers. And they used to get tired of it, but they remembered it as they got older. And this is something that has stuck with me all my life when it comes with attitude. Dr. Charles Sundahl wrote, the longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It's more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures, than successes, than what other people think, say, or do. It is more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, a home. The remarkable thing is, We have a choice every day regarding the attitude we embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We cannot change the inedible. The only thing we can do is play on the one string we have, and that is our attitude. I am convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. Yeah, and so it is with you, my friends. We are in charge of our attitude. The next time you decide to, re- to watch the evening news, listen to a presidential debate, listen to anything, you might want to read that first, okay? <laughs> and by the way, if you would like that, I mean this. You're like, I want that. I will get that to you. You call me, email me, text me, come into the church, say hi, take me to lunch. I will get it to you. And put it on your mirror, put it on whatever, the bathroom, the the midnight stand, whatever it is. It really, really grows. And there it is, right there. I'm waiting just a little bit so some of you know they're capturing it. But that is what attitude is all about. And Jesus took on an attitude that said, I'm willing to give up my deity, my triune God, my Godhead. I'm willing to empty myself, leave the sameness of God, but I'm taking one thing with me, unconditional love. Man, that's amazing. I'm going to go down to earth. They're going to make fun of me. They're not going to like me, but some are going to be healed, and they'll, they'll be like, okay, that's enough of that, so what? Some are actually going to say, I, I believe you're Christ, the son of the living God. Some are going to start to build the church of God, and when they kill me, I'm going to do something amazing. I'm going to die for them. Because I love them, not to guilt them, but to help them celebrate Easter every day. And then I'm going to give them the gift of the Holy Spirit, the wisdom of God. So what does that mean as as Paul begins to go into this hymn of praise? The first thing it is that to me is that the form of a suffering servant. This is kind of amazing. 
You know, when kings come, when kings come to power, they have money, they have backing. When a president starts to run for a presidential campaign, what's the first thing they do? They got to get the finances behind them. And we're talking millions and billions of dollars. They, they got to get this name behind them. They got to get this organization behind them. They got to get all these things in a row that have to do with money. What does Jesus do? He comes in a stable. You know, I've had the joy of milking cows by hand. <laughs> I grew up in the city, but I've had the joy of doing those milking contests to see if you can milk faster than the other person. That takes a lot. Don't do it. Anyway, and I've been working in dairy farms, and I used to help. And, and one time after the milking, they had the actual milking machines and all of that. You get a skid loader in the dairy farm. And you know what the skid loader's there to do after the cows are done milking and they're back out for pasture? It's to clean up the manure. Literally. I got to do that too. And I'm just pointing that out because Jesus, Joseph, and Mary come into Bethlehem late at night. This is not to be rude. Their family was not rude. It's all their family had left for the census. And this king of power comes in and he said, we got room in the stable. That's not how a king is born. That's not how you run for campaign. That's not how you take over the Roman Empire. No, he's born in a stable with the animals. And the first ones to see him are shepherds, the lowliest of the low. That's a suffering servant, man. That's one who comes and says, I love you so much, I am going to make myself less than you so you can understand the humanity of salvation and understand what a personal savior really means. Who began in the very, in the, who being in the very nature of God, verse six, Paul's amazing with this, did not consider equality the sameness, the sameness of God, equality with God. I'm not saying sane, I'm saying sameness, S-A-M-E of God, something to be used to his own advantage. Man, that's love. I live in a world where people take advantage of people. What am I going to gain out of this relationship? What am I going to gain with this job? What am I going to gain with this group of people? And, and we call it the food chain. And he comes across and says, I don't want that. I'm giving that up. I just want to be a suffering servant. Who does that? Man, if that doesn't mean God loves me, I don't know what it's going to take. And a servanthood of love, regardless of the gain. And then Paul goes on. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. I'm not coming as God. I'm coming in humanity so they can understand, so I can understand what it means to have the personal forgiveness. When I go through problems, he's not God going, well, that's really too bad. I don't know what that really is like because I'm God, you're not. No. He says, I know exactly what you're going through. And I understand it because I've been there. I went to the cross in humanity and human form not as God, but as human. And I understand what it means to fight what you're fighting. And I love you because I'm the servant of God. But, but, but it, it, it doesn't stop there. He also takes on the suffering servant quality of obedience. And this is something I have to learn every single day. He begins with this obedience to his father. If you ever want to read some great chapters, John chapter 17, John chapter 16, John chapter 15, it's all about eventually the prayer of doing my father's will before he goes to the cross, before he gets arrested. And it's just about this is the will of what you want for me. I was one of those rare people in life, I mean this with all my heart, who, who was born and raised with godly parents, and my father was everything to me, everything. I, I, if I could do half of what 
he was like in this world, I'll go far, and I mean that. And the reason he was everything is because of his heart for Christ. And when he would tell me on those occasions, I'm grateful for you or I'm, I'm proud of you, oh, did I cherish that. Oh, did I cherish that. And I know that's just not the way with a lot of fathers. I get it. A lot of you raise your hand, that wasn't my father, God. But that's what God is as a father. And he looked down on Jesus and he said, I'm grateful for everything you're doing for the people I love because I want them to know that they are worthy and you are the voice and the face and the image of what it means to let them know they are worthy through obedience. That's a crazy thing. And this hymn breaks out, therefore God exalted him. You know how we like to be lifted up in praise? I mean, we do. I mean this. We do. Okay? You don't have to hide it. We do like to be lifted up. Obviously, not a lot. There's a fine balance there. But when we're lifted up, it's so appreciated. The Son of God was lifted up, not because God came to earth thinking, okay, if I just do this, I can get this stake in heaven. He didn't come for that reason. He was lifted up out of authenticity. I have had the, the glory of having some really good mentors and I lift them up not because they need to be lifted up or they want to be lifted up. I lift them up because of what they've done for me and taught me. And here is God. And here's Paul saying, not only did he go to the cross, but because of his sheer love for us as a human being, because of his sheer love for us, willing to give up his deity, his sameness of God, God had no other response what to do but to exalt him. That was the only natural response that Jesus Christ could have. There's so much authenticity in what he did, there's no other way to explain it. And Paul says, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that every knee, above every name, sorry, and that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow on heaven and earth and under the earth, that's hell too. What more could we want? Yeah. What more could we want? I mean, thank you, Paul, for writing this hymn. Because it starts to make sense to me. And all of a sudden, I'm like, okay, I get it. He suffered. And there's times where I want to say, stop. I remember when I first saw the movie Passion, the, the Passion of Christ. It's a film about the death of Christ that was done actually with detail and complete emotion and what really happened. And I remember when they had the flogging and the Son of God is being flogged. He's whipped the night before and I didn't even want to see the crucifixion. I, I, I wanted to stand up in the movie theater and say, stop, I get it, enough, don't do any more. I'm yours. You don't need to go any further. But he did. That was just the beginning. And when he came into this world in that stable, that was his goal. He had no other goal. He was determined to make it to the cross. And if we can't understand love, then shame on us. And I know we've been hurt, but there's nothing that has done to us in this world that the Son of God can't break. And that's the birth of Christ, and that's why we celebrate Christmas. That's why the whole world stops and on the 24th and the 25th and says, well, this is the day that Christians celebrate Christ's birth. I was watching one of those um, Christmas movies last night, and this lady was so bent on getting, making sure that she won the Christmas award for her neighborhood, and she got married on Christmas, and everything was about Christmas, and it was just a movie, it's just made up, and, and, and her husband said, I'm tired of you focusing on yourself for Christmas. You can't even let Jesus have his birthday party. <laughs> I did like that part. <laughs> But sometimes we get there. We want the table's got to look just right. The presents got to look just right. These gifts got to be just right. We got to do this, 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 and this. It's about Jesus' birthday. The, the presents under the tree should be way less than the presents, if I can say that right, of God. Yeah. Yes. And, and the suffering servant with obedience is crazy love. 
It'll make a guy like Keith Green, and, and I, I used to listen to him a lot. He died in a plane crash and went to heaven before his time, but it'll make a guy like T Keith Green introduce a whole new way of music to the church in the late 70s because he wants to come back to Christ and find out what it means to exalt Christ. And so we move on, and we're going to go to the Old Testament now, to Isaiah, thousands of years before, and we look at why Jesus came. We know he came as a suffering servant. We know he gave up his deity. We know that he went all the way to the cross to give us Easter every single day. We, we know that he taught us obedience in a way that is not like whipped upon us and forced upon us with, with power, but out of true, unconditional love that we want to do this stuff. And then Isaiah reminds us that God said to him, it's for all people. It's for the people that I can't stand. We won't say any more, but it's there. It's for the people that I have a problem with in politics. It's for the people that I think are just getting too wealthy out of selfish ambition. It's for me when I never deserved it. It's for the ten lepers that he healed, and one of them came back, and the other nine didn't come back in the Gospels. You remember this? And he said, where are the other nine? Why didn't they come back? It's for all of the ten lepers he healed. It's for me. When I said, Lord, I really don't care about you right now, but it's still for me. And you can put me wherever you want in there. Because it's all of us. There's nothing I can do on this side of heaven to keep God from loving me. No matter how angry I get with God. And that's so amazing. We're going to sing in just a bit, Joy to the World, a wonderful Christmas hymn. The last verse, I want you to get this before I read verse 6 out of Isaiah. The last verse of Joy to the World is quite amazing. He rules the world. We're talking about Christ. Does he rule the world because he's going to overthrow the Roman government? Because he's going to run for office and take care of everything? No. He rules the world with truth. I am the Son of God. In grace. And he does it so authentically authentically with, with obedience and, and, and servanthood love that the world, the nations are like, we can't prove it any better. The nations will try to prove otherwise, but the nations are like, oh, I, I don't know what to do with this man. And we, we know what King Herod tried to do. If you don't, I can explain to you. He enacted a killing of all the firstborn in case so in hopes that he could get Jesus killed. I'm going to talk about a holocaust. The nations prove. The glories of his righteousness. <laughs> I don't care how much a person says, I don't believe in God. Well, could you, could you please help me with the righteousness part? Do you not get that? Well, I just don't believe it. I get it, but I don't believe it. <laughs> Amen. In the wonders of his love, and there's where this hymn that Paul's writing comes back in. It doesn't say in the wonders of his love, period. That's enough. We'll, we'll get to the next verse. In wonders of his love, in wonders, wonders, wonders. I keep adding wonders and wonders because when we live for Christ, we don't die. We live forever. We get to go to heaven. In the wonders, in the wonders, in the wonders, in the wonders of his love. In two weeks, even the news media will say the world stops so that Christians can recognize the birth of Jesus. Well, I say we recognize it every day. I say we celebrate Easter every day. I say we celebrate the fact that I'm worthy because of Christ and I as everyone every day. Because thousands of years earlier, a prophet who believed in Christ and was called by Christ in his mother's womb said, I, the Lord, have called you. This is God speaking to Jesus through Isaiah. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand 
Man, I could use that hand holding. That's the hand I want to hold. And I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. That's everyone. Everyone. That's the one that I don't like and the persons, the people that I love. All of the world. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove. We're still trying to see that today. The nations are still trying to prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love in wonders of his love in wonders, wonders of of his love. Amen. I'm going to ask you to join me in just a little bit of prayer, and then we're going to sing that closing song, Joy to the World. Gracious Lord, we thank you for Paul from a Roman prison coming up with this hymn. It's very hard for me to grasp the fullness of it, God. I can almost see you and your son, Jesus Christ, with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, talking so many billions and zillions of, of years before in the garden and saying, you know, they're, they're going to they're gonna figure out free will. I know our sovereignty understands that. What are we going to do? We're going to love them. What about when they hate us? We're going to love them. Are you willing to go down there? Oh, yes, I'm willing. Are you willing to give up your equality with God? Lord, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I have no response, Lord, but to understand what it means to say every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I don't understand the fullness of that, but I'm growing into it, Holy Spirit. But I know that your birth is the reason I get to live. I breathe because of your grace. I focus on your forgiveness from the cross to the grave to the sky to the resurrection, and I get to celebrate Easter every day, Lord. And I am forever thankful, even when I do make my mistakes, I'm thankful. Even when I do sin, I'm thankful. And so, Lord, we are thankful. If we don't know you today, Lord, if we haven't been about your neighborhood today for a while, if we need to build a new house in our heart, Lord, help us ask you for forgiveness. Take our old house and take it down. Destroy it with your love and build a new house, every closet in our heart, Lord. And help us know we are forgiven. Help us seek your forgiveness as the Savior, the Son of the living God, who did not take equality with God lightly. Help us see that love, Lord. Help us see that obedience. And help us want to be your disciples. We're moving into Christmas, Lord. And instead of saying happy holidays, we're believers in Christ. And so with a smile and a joy and a non-judgment attitude, obedience to you, we say Merry Christmas. And we thank you. We thank you. And so, Lord, with the power of the Holy Spirit, help us stand and join together with all our faith, joy to the world, in Jesus' name, all of God's people say, Amen.